Turn in your Bibles, if you will, John 20, 1 to 10. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. On that very special Sunday morning, almost 2,000 years ago, while the whole world was sleeping in sin, dark, the light of the world, the victorious and risen Lord, rose from the dead, broke through the bondages of sin and death and Hades. That's why we read in Revelation 1.18, Jesus said, I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. When we read the four Gospels, we find four diverse but unified descriptions about the resurrection of Jesus. Each of those descriptions is precious and significant. And today we look at the narrative as we find in John's Gospel. As we reflect on this last couple of chapters of John's Gospel, we find this is a precious personal and pastoral resource for all of God's people. Because here we see Jesus gently and lovingly comfort as well as restore his disciples. He enables them to overcome grief and doubt and even shame so that they will ultimately become glorious witnesses of his resurrection and joyful servants of God's people. But as I speak today, a pandemic rages in our world. A tsunami of death covers many nations. And the numbers we have for India are horrific. Officially, some 16 million people have been recorded being infected. There are more than 187,000 deaths that have been declared. And most of us think that those are underreported. This world is covered in darkness and pain. We read here that Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb while it is still dark. And in the Gospel of John, you would know that the darkness and light, that symbolism is very important for the Gospel writer. John chapter 1 verse 4 we read, In him was life and that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. 
whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life john 13:27 we read at that last supper as soon as judas took the bread satan entered him and in verse 30 it says as soon as judas had taken the bread he went out and it was night night darkness despair deep grief is what is now gripping our world mary was probably not alone though john does not specifically mention it we read she says we we read about that in mark 16 verse 1 but why does mary come to the tomb mary is going through deep grief she is seeking to find some comfort some connection with that one person who had made difference completely changed her life made the difference of death and life and so she thought maybe she will get some comfort by anointing the body of her crucified lord but you don't expect her to come with any great expectations of the lord being risen or anything like that because nobody expected in those days or now to go to a graveyard or a place where somebody is buried to find them rising that does not happen does it so mary comes sees a tomb is empty and she runs to the disciples and then we read about two men run peter and this one person who is called the beloved disciples they also see what had happened to the body they saw the strips of linen and the head cloth still lying in its place and it says peter does not understand he shakes his head in puzzlement he doesn't say oh yes jesus said he will rise again in fact peter's puzzlement is another pointer to the authenticity of this story but the other disciple the one enigmatically called the beloved disciple in the gospel of john he goes inside he says he saw and he believed in fact he is the first one to believe in the resurrection in this gospel he is that ideal disciple in john's gospel he is the one who becomes the blessed one if you look at chapter 20 verse 29 jesus says blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed there are only two beatitudes in the gospel of john here in 2029 and the one in 1317 when after washing their feet jesus says blessed are you if you also serve your brothers and sisters for the beloved disciple it was a sight of the burial clothes that revealed the truth born out of love that was otherwise unthinkable for him this was no grave robbers doing jesus's body had passed through the clothes now the resurrection happened at night or early morning no one was there to witness it except the angels of heaven and god jesus had entered the kingdom of death and had carried away its spoils and he came away victorious john 20 verse 10 we read and the two disciples went back home but mary didn't go where is our home for mary a home was with jesus where was home for mary where was her hope her hope was in her lord 
But then she saw him crucified and it seemed all hope was gone. Mary stays back, struggling. She's still in darkness, in deep grief and despair. Friends, death is a killer. Death not just disorients us, but devastates us. This morning, a little girl, a young girl, her mother is dead today. And she says, I can't even weep. Today, just a few hours ago, I watched the funeral of a friend, a member of my church, a wonderful believer, Brother Murali. It is devastating. Death is not a joke. It's not something we say, oh yeah, it'll come. And it happens to other people, no. Death is a horrible monster that devastates us. I want you to think about that instance in John chapter 11, Jesus at the graveside of Lazarus. There we read John 11 verse 33 and again in 38 that Jesus was deeply moved. Now, th the word that John actually uses there is a very hard word. It's not easy to translate that. It is not only is he sad, but he's also angry. Why is Jesus angry? And then it says, Jesus wept. Now, Jesus was going to raise Lazarus in a few minutes. He knew that. He could have said, no need to worry now. He's going to be all right. But Jesus at that point was so close to that greatest enemy who he has to fight, death itself. But he was going to do that in a few days' time. And he could sense that enemy right before him, death. The enemy of God, because God is a living God. But he was not yet going to engage him. He engaged him proleptically. In that way, he raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus was facing the greatest enemy of God. And then, few days later, Jesus went to the cross. We can still try to think, fathom the depths of that cross, which is the greatest symbol in the world, the most meaningful symbol in the whole world today, the cross of Jesus. We don't fully understand all the aspects and the depths of it, but the writers of the Gospels and the letters will say in different ways what was the significance of what had happened. Paul will say in 2 Corinthians 5, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And it was the most humiliating, horrible way to die. Friends, one of the things we know from our crucified Lord is that God is with us when we go through pain. But when we go through pain, we ask God this question, why God? We prayed. Why did you not answer our prayers? Why did you not do what we wanted you to do. You can do it. Why did you not do it? And I know there's no easy answer to that, my dear friends. All of us in the last few days have either lost family or dear friends in this pandemic. And yet we ask the question, Lord, where are you? But God was in Christ coming into the world. He became Emmanuel with us. And on the cross, 
on that cross god wants to just assure us that he is with us he has entered suffering the world of suffering for us so that he will enter with us be with us but bring us out ultimately victorious that jesus who went on the cross is the victorious jesus i want to share a very simple analogy that i find helpful to understand what jesus has done for us in the cross and the resurrection during the second world war on june 6th there is a very special day which is called d day june 6 1944 let me explain during the second world war about 30 countries were involved but they were divided into two opposing military alliances one was the allied forces the others was the axis so about 100 million people tragically were involved in that conflagration so on a very important day it's called june 6th 1944 often referred to as d day the allied forces in a large number landed on the beaches of normandy that was a plan they had prepared it was called the code name was operation overlord and on that day they landed and in a sense according to their plan this day june 6 1944 was the beginning of the end of the war but many many allied soldiers died and in the ensuing 11 months several battles were fought in many of the european countries and thousands upon thousands of lives were lost in these battles till may 8th 1945 that was called v day victory day but between d day and v day the battle raged and many many soldiers on both sides died but finally western europe was liberated from hitler and nazi germany and the war came to an end friends think about it like this the life the death and resurrection of jesus is like the d day the decisive victory has been won on the cross God came and planted his flag of victory that was the cross victory belongs to God however till we wait for that last day the coming of the lord the battle rages but not for victory but from victory the lamb of god is victorious and we wait for that beautiful day the coming of the lord turn with me to john chapter 20 verses 11 to 18 john 20 11 to 18 now mary stood outside the tomb crying as she wept she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus's body had been one at the head and the other at the foot and they asked her woman why are you crying they have taken my lord away she said and i don't know where they have put him at this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there but she did not realize that it was jesus he jesus asked her woman why are you crying who is it you are looking for thinking he was a gardener she said sir if you have carried him away tell me where you have put him and i will get him jesus said to her 
Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Mary, in her darkness, does what we all do. We weep. Sometimes the shock of death is so much that we are not able to weep even. And as she is crying, she looks up and she sees two angels who ask her that obvious question, why are you weeping? And then comes Jesus. This grieving disciple is chosen by Jesus to be the first one to see the risen Lord. But he again asks her the same question. Now, are you surprised? Right. Doesn't Jesus know why she is weeping? It's almost as if Jesus is teasing her. But Mary does not recognize Jesus yet. She mistakes Jesus now in his resurrected body to be the gardener. This time, Jesus doesn't wait too long like we read in the last chapter of Luke with the two disciples on the way to Emmaus where he has a long conversation with them. Here Jesus says, he calls her tenderly, calls her by name, no more drama, Mary. Now, the reader of this gospel will remember the words of Jesus earlier where he says, I am the good shepherd. And he says, my sheep know my voice. And for Mary, it is the voice of Jesus that right away connects with who she is. She cries out, Rabboni, my teacher. And in her incredible joy, because her home was with Jesus, she's got everything back. She clings to Jesus. Now, maybe some translations say, don't touch me. That is not exactly what is the happening here. Jesus can be held. He's got a resurrected body that can be touched. And Mary is holding on to him. But Jesus says, it's okay, Mary. You don't have to hold on to me. Worried whether, you know, I will disappear, leave you and go. Like sometimes... Children, when they are crying, want to cling on to their parents for support. Jesus says, it's okay, Mary. Why does Jesus say you don't have to cling on to me? Because there has now been a radical change in the relationship between the disciple and the Lord. The nature of the relationship as master and disciple now enters a new phase. Disciples, like in those days, don't have to seek the physical presence of their master anymore. Because now, as a resurrected Lord, He is always with them through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then it says, once Jesus is ascended to the Father, the same resurrected Lord would be present with them always through the Holy Spirit. And that's what he said. At the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus turns to his disciples. What does he tell them? Go into all the world. Make disciples. And I am with you always. The resurrected Lord is with us always but we need to see that through the eyes of faith. What a glorious assurance, my friends. 
Jesus is telling Mary and telling all of us that you don't have to worry and seek just the physical presence. I am going to be present with you in real through the Spirit. And then what does Jesus do? He commissions Mary as a witness to the other disciples. Do you realize that? And for the first time in this gospel, he refers to the disciples as my brothers. So friends, through Jesus, our elder brother, who is now resurrected, which by the way is our final destiny, to be like Jesus, believers are now included in the family of God as God's children and Jesus our elder brother. Disciples are welcomed into the eternal relationship. We are welcomed into that relationship that existed from eternity between God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And one more thing I want you to notice by the way, don't miss this, it's a great encouragement to the majority of people many times in our churches, women. Women were the first and dependable witnesses of the resurrection. That too, women and men are now given the same privilege by God to be witnesses of the resurrection. The experience we have with Christ. And then we read about that in, from verse 19 onwards, how Jesus reveals himself to many disciples. That same evening, the risen Jesus appeared to many of his disciples. It was not the empty tomb that convinced the disciples that Jesus had been raised from the dead. No. They saw him. They ate with him. They touched him. He cooked breakfast for them. Ate with them and he showed them the marks of the crucifixion. His was a real body. Even though it was made of matter from the new creation. That new creation that he talked about. The kingdom of God that he ushered in. Saying the kingdom of God has come. Repent and believe the good news. Now because of that no wonder the disciples struggled sometimes to recognize him. He offered to Thomas the visible and tangible proof of his resurrected body. And then Thomas moves from skepticism to that most grandest of confessions. He said, my Lord and my God. After these disciples, when they had seen their crucified Lord humiliated on the cross, they must have felt what a waste of our life that we abandoned everything and followed him and now it all looks like a cruel joke. They were hopeless, numbed into inaction. But then something happened to change that situation for them. What else could have happened except that they really saw the risen Lord? Nothing else can explain the fact that these dejected disciples a few days later, have become bold witnesses, ready to take on the whole religious establishment, which a few days ago had handed over Jesus to be killed. No pious or nebulous idea of the soul being alive could have comforted or helped these tired and frightened disciples. No, they saw the risen Lord. What else can explain the boldness of Peter? except that he was personally reinstated as a shepherd by the Lord Jesus, as we read in chapter 21. Friends, we have many questions during these times, and it's all right to ask questions. I have many questions. But God is answering us and saying, look, I am with you. I have entered into your suffering. I have joined with you to redeem you. And I have entered the cross. This definitive act of God has taken place. This has cosmic implications. Because a living God has now won the battle against the last enemy, 
that is death. This victory over death is now will be shared by all of us who believe. The resurrection of Jesus is now the basic ground of our faith. On the day when the church around the world celebrates Easter, the resurrection day, we celebrate the undoing of death. Jesus has undone death. We now celebrate the coming of God's new creation. The inauguration of the kingdom of God in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul is very clear. He says, therefore, if in anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. Friends, what is our hope? When we go through the reality of sickness and death, tragic death, unexpected, we hold on to Jesus. And we hold on to that hope that the crucified and risen Lord is our hope, is our victory. Friends, the kingdom of God that Jesus announced and still embodies in his resurrected body is the theme song of the New Testament. The remaining stanzas will be sung not now, but when the kingdom is fully consummated. The new heaven and new earth will arrive. This whole creation is groaning to be redeemed. But the resurrection of Jesus is the main signpost to that assured final victory of God over all sin and all evil in this world. Meanwhile, remember that analogy from Second World War. You and I are called to be foot soldiers of this kingdom. We go around the world fighting a war with very different weapons. The weapons of the kingdom, we bring good news of God's love to people. The good news of the kingdom has come. We speak truth to power. We challenge evil. We identify life-denying policies in our communities. We join with the oppressed and the poor. We serve in sacrificial love, even serving those who may appear as enemies. Those are the weapons of the kingdom of God. And then who do we follow? Like the book of Revelation says, we follow the Lamb of God, the enthroned Lamb of God, which signifies the crucified Lord. Wherever He leads us, we shall follow. All the while, we keep praying, Lord, let Thy kingdom come. Let Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Where is our hope? Our hope is in the crucified and risen Lord Jesus. My dear brothers and sisters, today let me just encourage you. Where is our hope as we face the painful realities of life? Sometimes we wish all this will be taken away and we will not have to go through pain in this world. Unfortunately, friends, that doesn't seem to be the way Scripture teaches us. But Jesus promises to be with us, the resurrected Lord, and the one who has gone through the deepest of pain and suffering is with us. But He is victorious and we can hold on to Him. He is present with us in the Spirit. He is our hope. The crucified and risen Lord is your hope and my hope.